La Laura, I, I tease her all the time and tell her that, that she's my closer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I kid you not, almost every time I speak, the Lord give her words to say afterwards, and she come up, and I just go back, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we got it out of sequence, but maybe the Lord, we're we, we praying that he'll make things right. Amen. We were meeting in, in, with Nathan and Melissa, Pastor Marvin knows it, and Gary. We all were together, and we were trying to decide on some of the themes that we would use here. So Nathan asked, what was on his heart? I said, well, the Lord had been laying a thing on my heart. I don't know if it's for Mesa or not. And the subject is overcoming feelings of inadequacy. Okay. So that's what we're going to be talking about, overcoming feelings of inadequacy. Now, the first thing, it's only three words in, that sub, in, in this subject. Actually, it's four, but three of, of is just not a, you know, it's just a... But we've got three words there, and we're going to start at the last one, inadequacy, because it's something that we deal with all the time, every day. We don't use the word, but the definition of the word we use every day. Okay, for coming to the mountains where we are now, I can almost guarantee you to the person, every driver that drove up here, at some point on that road, checked their gas to make sure that they had adequate fuel to make it up here. Am I right or am I wrong? Everyone. I mean, if you didn't do it, I'm telling you, you're good. You're better than I am. Because <laughs> that's one of the first things I did when I got in here. I looked and said, ooh, we only got like a fourth of a tank. No, nope, that ain't going to make it. I knew because cause adequacy, adequate is making sure that you have enough. Uh -huh. So we make sure to have enough gas. And you also, if you got an older car, you probably check your oil. You want to make sure, okay, my, my car has a tendency <laughs> of using oil. Do I need an extra quart? So you may put an extra quart someplace just in case you have to have it. That's what we do in life. So we want to make sure that we have enough. And you're also going to, for the real conscientious drivers, they check the air pressure. Not a lot of y'all did that, right? Yeah, oh, see? We got brand new cars. Brent. <laughs> so, so you want to make sure that you have enough. Inadequate, it, if, if you look at the word inadequate, adequate is having enough. Inadequate is not enough. It's sort of like if you're doing math and you do the number 10 and you put 10 right underneath that, and automatically you add those two together and you got 20. But if you put a minus sign in front of that bottom 10, you got nothing. Well, that's what happens when you put in in front of adequacy. You do not have enough. It's just the opposite. So sometimes we feel inadequate to do things that we have been asked to do. Sometimes we feel out of place. Sometimes we have a lot of things that we feel, which is the second word is feeling. Feeling is not necessarily reality. It's just what we feel. And we're going to get there prayerfully. But in order to get there, we're going to do something. In the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, this is not a scripture you're going to be using, but the 12th, tra chef tra blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the 12th chapter says something like this. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, and what he's talking about, the things that he talked about in the 11th chapter, is the book of faith. And what he does, the writer there goes through all the men of the Old Testament. I say men, men, women of the Old Testament uh, and, and the faith that they showed and the things that they did and how those things actually showed or uh, described or gave us the definition of what faith is. So we're going to do the same thing or similar thing. So we're going to use some of the people in the Old Testament who had inadequacies in their lives. Okay. One of the first guys we're going to talk about is Abraham. When you hear Abraham, one of the things that we say about him, he is the father of faith. How many of you know that Abraham went through some things that he did not show a lot of faith in? He, he did not. I mean, it wasn't something that he, he was just a normal man like we are. He was just a normal person. But he had some inadequacies in his life. Well, at least there was moments that he, not his best moments. And we're going to talk about one of those. Here he is, Abraham, his wife, Sarah. 
Lot, his nephew, all the people that was with him, all this spot, livestock that they had, they are transitioning them from one place to the place that God was leading them, and a drought hit the land. Uh -huh. And Abraham looked and said, man, we don't have enough food, we don't have enough water, because he's not just concerned about him. He's concerned about all the people that was with him. Just like um, I'm sure Melissa knows when they're thinking about um, Mesa Conference, and we're going to have enough food, we have enough water, we have this, and they're going through this whole checklist of things because you don't want to be found without. And that's where he was. Except for them, they couldn't just run down to the store here and get something that they needed. There was nothing. Amen. There was a drought in the land, uh -huh. and they're running low on food, running low, not knowing where they're going to get water from, and the only place they can get it was to go down to Egypt. Okay. So Abraham, he says, he looking, he go, man, when I get down there and these guys see my wife, oh boy, she is a looker. <laughs> I mean, he says, man, she looks good. Uh -huh. We may use now is hot. Boy, she hot. <laughs> I mean, she's so hot that when these guys see her, they're going to kill me and take her. <laughs> you know, and uh, I, and that's what, I know that's going to happen. I know it. I, I know how men think. That's how we think, man. She looked good. So, you know, he, was, he, he became concerned about that. So this was not probably one of his most proudest moments. But he goes to his wife, Sarah, and said, listen, you know they're going to kill me when we get down there. So what I need for you to do is to just agree with me when I tell them that you are my sister so that it will be well with me. Now, I, all you women, right? Y'all going, that's what I want my man to do right there. <laughs> no. You probably are thinking like, what? <laughs> are you crazy? Because she knew what that entailed, right? That means that, and, and that it's exactly what happened. And they go down there, and me and see her, they went back to the Pharaoh and said, man, you ought to see this woman coming in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's talking about looking fine. She is fine. She is something else. And they brought her to him. And she went into, well, what happened came his wife, but God intervened. Uh -huh. Now, some would say that maybe Abraham knew that God was going to intervene. Uh, the scripture doesn't say that. I guess it sounds good. It, it gives them a little bit more credibility when we say that. But the truth is, he, he probably didn't know. Now, okay, wives, are y'all going to be in agreement when your husband... <laughs> Time to praise him, right? <laughs> oh, Lord, no. Yeah, praise him. So that was not one of his finest moments. But that is exactly what happened to him. So there are times in your life when you may feel just like Abraham. I don't know what I'm going to do, and some of the decision that you made was not necessarily good. Not one that you're proud of. Ones that if you, when you reflect back over them, you go like, man... I blew it. I just blew it. I just blew it. The other guy we're going to talk about is Moses. Now, Moses, we know the story about Moses and how God chose him to deliver Israel out of the, from the Egyptians. One day, he was out, and he see one of his fellow kinsmen being mistreated by an Egyptian, and he steps in. He ended up killing the guy and tried to hide it. And those things. Well, the next day he saw two Hebrew guys out fighting, and he go, I "Man, what are y'all doing fighting, man? You no, know, here I am. You guys are fighting." And they look and said, "What are you going to do? Kill us like you did the Egyptians?" He said, "Oh Lord, the people know now," yeah. and he left. And for years he was out in the wilderness. He went, he went, and he's married. Um, all the things that happened in his life, and I know you guys know those things, so we're not really trying to do that part. But when he goes out one day to tear him for a sheep on the other side of the mountain it says on the west side so he goes out in a far distant place a place where no one is and there is where he saw the burning bush in the burning bush and it says that he saw this thing burning and it wasn't consumed we could we can understand that now because we had gas logs in the place over here right where you just turn the gas on <laughs> and you see the wood in there and it just burned and burned where well, the logs never burn up but the fire's hot. But we, we see that. Oh, well, we know what that was. But back then, you know, that probably wasn't what it was. But, but we, you know, sometimes when you can see things, things don't look so dramatic as they did during that time. 
hey, I'm going to see what's happening here. And he went over, and that's where he met God, or God met him, or God spoke to him. And God told him, I want you to go and tell pharaohs to let my people go. The first thing Moses did was, I can't go down there. I, I don't speak the language anymore. It's been so long since I've been there. So who am I, Lord, that you should tell me to go to speak to them? Have you ever been asked to do something and you know that you're inadequate for it? Now, it may be a reality that you do not have the training to do what you're being asked to do. And you know that. I, I work with wood, and I get splinters occasionally in my finger. I can go out and take a pair of tweezers and pull it out, right? I can do that. But if you ask me to perform heart surgery on you, <laughs> that's beyond my training. <laughs> I hadn't been trained for that. I mean, I may cut you and look and see what's going on and think. <laughs> I hadn't been trained for that. And I know the scripture says I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Maybe it should also say the things that you train to do help. I mean, I mean, that's, I don't, if I'm getting on a plane, you know, I, I, yeah, it's nice if the pilot is a Christian, but the first thing I want to know is does he know how to fly a plane? You know, it's, it's, you know, if he's a Christian, that's a plus. But the first thing I want to know, do you know how to fly a plane? So sometimes, you know, we're just not equipped. We know that we're not equipped to do what we're being asked to do. But it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means that I'm just not equipped, and God's got to work harder. So, so Moses, that's where Moses was. He said, I can't speak the language. So finally, God really got a little, up, a little upset with him. Have you ever felt like God's been upset with you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> Yes, he has. <laughs> there was one time the Lord told me to um, give this guy, I think it was like $50. Uh, anyway, anyway, he said, no. He was going through a rough time. He said, you need to give him $50. So I said, well, Lord, I thought about it for a little bit. I said, you know what? No, I don't think he, I believe 25 would be enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and I heard this voice says, if you can't do what I tell you, when I tell you, I can't use you. I went, man. So I went ahead and gave him the $50. Of course, he was going to repay me. But when I gave it to him, he said, man, you don't know how much I appreciate this. Now, I plan to pay you back. I don't know when or how much. And I'm going like, man, I ain't going to even get my money back. I, it was a loan, but, but it wasn't. That's, that's not what God told me. So, you know, sometimes we are asked to do things that we really don't want to do. Uh, sometimes he may tell you to give. In this case, I mentioned money to give, and you may not have it to give. But you have to figure out what God is really saying and what he wants you to do. If, and when you know what he says, that's what he intends for you to do. And if you can't do what he tells you, when he tells you, he really can't use you. When he starts having to find someone else to do the work that he called you to do, you're becoming, I hate saying it like this, how would that look? You're becoming of no use to him. So we have to just do the simple things that he says. It's not always big things, and we think that it is, but it's really not. Abraham, Moses, these guys were men of patriots. Oh, good guys, really, but they had shortcomings as well. Now, that's not highlighting their shortcomings, but I want you to understand that you're in good company when you have these feelings. Not only these two guys, there was another man by the name of Gideon. I love Gideon. Gideon, here's this guy, he's out there working in the fields because, or actually he was threshing wheat into a, a barn, a wheat place, wherever they did that stuff at. That's where he was. He was out there working. And uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, oh, valid man of God. Gideon's response was one of honesty. A mighty man of God. And God is with us. If God is with us and we are so powerful, why are we hiding now from the, you know, the people that's coming against her. Why am I having to be out in this place here, shredding wheat, shaking these things just so we have enough food to eat, hiding so that I won't be seen? If God is with us, then why are these things happening to us? And God says to him, go in your own strength and deliver Israel. Mm. Oh. Go like, ah. So he began to do some things. 
He said, well, you know what, Lord? I'm going to make this agreement with you. I'm going to put a fleece or a coat out in the morning. In the morning, if it's wet and the grounds around it is dry, then I know you're speaking to me, and I'll do what you want. Go to bed, wake up the next morning, reach down, take the fleece, and it, the scripture says that he was able to wring out a bowl of water out of that fleece. So the only thing that was wet was that fleece. Now, for many of us, we would go like, that's God. Let's go. But he said, you know what, Lord? <laughs> you know what, Lord? Now, I, let, let's just try this something different. Maybe, 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 maybe someone came in the night and poured water on their mouth. You know, maybe, maybe something happened. Y'all ever try to reason why God didn't tell you to do something? Yeah, you know he told you, but you know, mm, I don't know about that. So he said, well, let's just do it just to, to reverse this thing. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up, and the, the fleece is going to be dry, and all the grounds around is wet. And it was just as he said. He woke up, the thing dry, the grounds are wet with dew. So he knew that God was calling him and telling him to do certain things. Have you put out fleece before to God? <laughs> yeah, I have. Yeah. And I still didn't want to do it. Yeah, I, he, he did. Um, he spoke to me once in a church service, and I was at a visit, visiting the church, and, and I don't want to go through all the details, but we was, we was in there, and the Lord started speaking to my heart about some things, and he started showing me people in church. He showed me the whole of senior choir. In, in churches I grew up in, they had the senior choir would be on one side, and the junior choir was on the other side. It was just choirs, and, and that's where they were. And he went down the front Every person on that front row, second row, third row, the fourth row, he was pointing out their life to me. And I'm sitting back there looking like, what in the world is going on here, Lord? And the guy's preaching, and I can't hear, I don't know what he preached about, because all I could do was hear his voice. There's one guy that was involved in witchcraft, and um, he actually was a root doctor for those who, who may know about those things. And he was showing hit me him and and this person been going to see him because of that. I'm going like, why in the world? What in the Lord? What are you doing? And then he starts saying, I have young people here that I'm trying to reach and draw to me. And they won't come because they see all the mess that these guys are doing. And he said, and I want you to get up and tell them that. I said, oh, no. No. So... Don't it, when you get a word from the Lord, isn't it exciting? <laughs> We're, are you all excited as I probably was in? Now, my knuckles, if I had been white, they would have been white. Because I was holding on to the pew because I was not moving. Uh-uh, no way, no way am I getting up doing that. I'm not doing that. No, 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 no. No. <laughs> and he kept saying, go tell them. I'm going like, no. <laughs> no. I can't do that. So, and fin finally, the, the preacher that Sunday, he finished preaching, and he did an altar call. No. Okay, I, I'll go up for prayer, and that's what we'll do. So, we go up for prayer, and... I bowed. Everybody else had the head bowed, and he prayed. And I don't know how long it was, but a lady came up and said, are you all right? <laughs> I looked around and said, where did everybody go? And they all like, sat down because he, had, he was finished praying. And, I, and I'm standing up all alone. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Lord, I... I, I, I said, the Lord, he, he really wants to, uh, there's some young people here that he wants to bless, that he wants to save, that he wants to come to Christ. I tried my best to clean things up, <laughs> to make it not sound so hard. And, um, and, and, and short story, short it up, there was a few people came up and we prayed for them. But there was a lady, a young lady that was ushering at the back of the church. And when I got ready to go to sit down, as I began to walk, I walked right past my seat 
to where she was. And I went back and said to her, your parents are trying to get you to do something that God doesn't want you to do, and don't do it. And I turned and went and sat down. And when I sat down, the Lord showed me. This wasn't part of what I was planning to share, all right? Uh, the Lord showed me this young lady's grandmother standing before me, vividly angry, just angry, and just scolding me. And I went like, oh, my goodness. And he, he said, tell her that she does not have neither heaven nor hell that she can put her granddaughter. And I said, man, I, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> I'm, <just, laughs> I'm serious. I just wanted to go home. <laughs> I didn't want to be at church. I didn't want to be there. I just wanted to go home. That's all I, well, I just want to go home. I, just, I was in tears. I, was like, I just want to go home. <laughs> and, um, and sure enough, when they dismissed, the guy who was preaching that Sunday called the pastor was on vacation that day. He came back. He said, hey, man, um, this lady want to talk to you? I said, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it's just like I said, when she came up, she was, I mean, she was so angry. You, we don't need you coming here telling her anything. If she need anything... I'm here, her parents are here, you just blah, and, and I mean, she just chewed me out, I, I was raw, and, uh, and I told her, I just told her what God said, I said, God told me to tell you that you don't have neither heaven nor hell to place your granddaughter, and she turned around, if, if she used, if she was not in church, she probably would have been using profanity, <laughs> and she just walked away, just angry as she can be, so on my way home, I'm driving home. My eyes fill up with tears. I actually have to pull off the road. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to deal with this. I was a young guy, and I had never heard of anything like this. I was, grew up in a Baptist church. Uh, we didn't know anything about, I didn't know anything about speaking in tongues. I mean, I've seen people do that. I didn't know anything about the gifts of the Spirit, how they operate. I knew none of that stuff, no, absolutely nothing. And I was experiencing that, all of them. And, and the Lord, and I said, Lord, I just don't know how to deal with this. And he backed off from a lot of those things in my life because it was more than I knew how to deal with at the time. I felt inadequate to do what God was directing me to do. And it happens to us. We talked about Old Testament guys, so sometimes we, we get hung up on that. But that's Old Testament. It didn't happen in New Testament. And there was a guy named Timothy. Paul calling his son in the ministry. And there's one scripture that says, when Paul writes to him and tell him, do let not people look down upon you because of your youth. Because sometimes young people, you see, when young people are experiencing things of God, they don't know how to express some of those things. And we older guys can be intimidating. You know, it can be intimidating. Well, you know, they are the pastors. They're the leaders. They are the elders. They should know these things. If they say yay or nay, that's the way it has to be. But sometimes God will use children to expose our weaknesses. So we have to be willing to allow young people to share. I didn't, I, I never, I didn't share this with you, Madison. So don't, don't feel on the spot because that's not what I'm doing, Okay. But one of the Sundays you guys were, were the way and I was speaking and you led praise and worship. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was the very first time that you led praise and worship at Zamar. Now, you may have led it someplace else, but not at Zamar that I know of. But it was the first time. And that morning, the anointing of God was so powerful. He, for those, if y'all, anybody that was here can remember, it was just a powerful, it was powerful. So much so that when we had recap on Wednesday, the question was, wonder what triggered the anointing of God to move so powerfully that Sunday? And as we were, everybody was coming up with different things, and the Lord kind of dropped in my spirit was this, that you needed to know that he's there with you, that he, that he has your back, that you're his chosen vessel. And it's not about your necessarily physical abilities, nothing wrong with that. 
but it's about his anointing that he's placing on you. And that's what God wants to do. Now, how do we overcome feelings? Feelings are just feelings. Mm -hmm. And, and then they actually motivate us to do or not to do, right. but they're not necessarily real. Right. They're not real. Have you ever felt someone just hated you and you get to know them and found out that you were so wrong? Right. See, that feeling was wrong. Have you ever felt that you could just do anything and you get started and you find out that you're not physically equipped to do what you think you yeah. could do? That's a feeling. But how do we overcome feelings of inadequacy? Well, in Abraham's life, what God did was showed him who he was. And he spoke to him and proved himself to Abraham the words that he spoke to him, the words that he spoke over him. I don't know that anybody actually spoke over Abraham. But I can't recall that, that they did. But the words that God spoke to Abraham, he never let them fail. He was there with him. With Moses, Moses had all these signs that he gave him. He proved himself to Moses who he was. And Moses became more and more convinced that God was with him to the point that he could stand up before pharaohs and tell him this is what God says, that the firstborn of all the children in Israel are going to die, for, except for those who have blood on the threshold of the household. And it happens just as he said. So when God speaks to you and he convinced you and you finally accepted who you are in Christ Jesus, then you can do those things. Moses, when he was leading the children of Israel out, they come to the river, the Red Sea, he looked at the enemies behind him, the Red Sea in front of him, and don't know where to go. And he, he began to pray. This is what he began to do, pray. And the Lord says, why are you calling out to me? Stretch forth your rod. You know, you know what to do. Sometimes we are busy praying about things that God have already told us to do. And it's time for us to just stretch forth our rod, step forth our feet, and start to do what he's telling us to do. You do what God tells you to do, and the signs will follow you. Uh -huh. He didn't say the signs are going to lead you. The signs will follow you. But only when you move can they follow you. So we have to be in a position, position ourselves to do what God wants you to do. It's tough. I'm telling you, it's a hard sometimes to make these decisions. They're life-changing. They change your family. You change the direction of your families oftentimes that we've been doing this and we've been doing it wrong and I need to get it right. Uh -huh. And your family is going to rebel right. because they're comfortable doing those things. Right. But when you begin to walk and do the things that God wants you to do, then he can show himself strong in your life. Right. Timothy, don't be afraid to tell them the truth. The truth can be frightening depending on who you are telling it to. Right. When you are telling people in leadership that they are wrong, that is very, very uncomfortable. But you still got to do it. You still got to do it. So how do we overcome them? There's a scripture saying something like, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are of a good report, whatsoever things are honorable, think on these things. Make them be a part of your life. Put them in front of you. And walk toward those things. Focus on those things. Don't focus on all the negative stuff that people tell you. Because that will, that will mold the way you think. Right. Y'all may not know this, but um, I'm an Afro-American. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went to school, when I finished high school in 68, the school that I finished, uh, we were still segregated. And our teachers would instruct us, listen, when you go out in the world, you're going to have to be twice as good as none Afro-Americans if you're going to be successful. Because people are always going to be looking for you to fail. They're always looking for you to mess up. They're always looking for that. So you got to be careful about how you handle yourself and what you do. And you got to be careful. And you got to make sure that you can do it better than anyone else. Those are the things that we were taught. I worked at a place in East Springs called Skyline. And 
However, in the department, the shipping department, I think there was only two black guys that was there. And my job was to pull orders. So we would get an invoice. The invoice may have had 20 items on it. Those 20 items had the ID numbers, and they had the quantity that their customer wanted. And we did this by hand. So all the items are stored in the warehouse, just warehouse of shelves and not shelves, but bins of them. And I would look at the invoice, scan the invoice, and go and pull every item on there, the right quantity, and place them in a place so that the people that was packing them could do that. And I had gotten so good at that, at memory, I could take two and three invoices, look at them, put the invoice down, get a fork lift, go pull everything on there, place them in stack. You know, when they got ready for them, it was right there. And it'd take a long time to do that. Well, it was, I was doing it so quickly until the guys were asking to me, how are you doing that? And I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know I was doing anything, really. I was just doing my job. I said, doing what? He said, how can you pull all these things? I said, it's on the, on the list. You just look on the list and go get them. That's, that's all it is. So I feel like I'm chasing rabbits. <laughs> but so what happened was we, we had so many orders come in that, that we, we were so backed up that we couldn't get them out. They created two shifts. We was working six days a week, no, no chances to get off. Everybody was upset. Couldn't get off a day. They wouldn't let you off of anything. So finally, they decided if we were able to pull a certain quantity by sat Friday, we would be able to be off that Saturday. So the question came up. and said, well, what happens if uh, we pull the orders and you see that we could have made this, but if the machines and things break down, we can't do it. So, well, if that happens, we're going to go ahead and let you off. Well, I, they had created two shifts. I had to go to the second shift and start doing that. So I had to pull all these orders. When I left um, Thursday, Thursday morning, they only needed about four hours to be done with everything that was on that list, and the machine broke. Oh. So they wasted all day Thursday, Thursday night, well, Friday, up until Friday, and there was no way we was going to get it. But we had to go in that Saturday. So we go to work that Saturday. Everybody's <laughs> very happy. <laughs> Oh, you remember that negative thing? I need to put the un in front of that. We need that. Everybody was unhappy. So we go to lunch. So we come back. Everybody agree. Okay, man, we, we're not going to, we're going home. We're going home. We're going home. Everybody. Everybody's going home. That's it. No, we're going to go home. So we get there. The supervisor says, look, I know y'all don't want to be here. We understand. We told you guys could be off, but it, this is a business, and we got to get these orders out. Now, if you don't want to do it, I can't force you to stay here. But if you leave, you know, just consider yourself as fired, and that's just the way it is. And um, we're all standing around, the head, man, they're doing it. And then he says, that go for you too, Warren. And I go like, well, why did, he, why did he single me out? I mean, all of us standing there together. There's about 20 of us. And all of us, he just singles me out. I go like, well, wow, I wonder why he did that. I said, oh, well, okay, I guess I'll go home. <laughs> so I went home. It was only two guys that would pull orders, me and another guy. And I went to the little store down there. About 30 minutes later, the other guy came up. <laughs> he said, Sidewinder, I left too, man. I said, really? Said, yeah, man. I tried to talk to them guys. He said, they're a bunch of chicken litter guys. <laughs> 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 <Whew>. <laughs> Boy, I, that was scary. I was <laughs> and, uh, so, so I don't even know why I was there anyway. Lord, I don't know what happened. But, but what happened was, after that, the manager over the department, the next week when I went to pick my check up, and he called me in the office, and I had to talk to him. He wanted to know what happened. Well, I just I told him what happened. He said, well, I'm so sorry that it happened. You say, you know, if you really wanted your, your job back, you can come back. But I had already gotten another job by then. And, and I've always felt inadequate in a lot of things in life. In school, I started when I was five years old. 
So all the kids in my class were older than I was. So I always felt like I was the youngest. I felt like David, like I was the youngest. I was always small in stature. Uh, I think that's one reason why I, I smile every time I see Brandon. Bryson, Bryson thank you. Because he, he, he's a smaller stature. Well, that was me. You always felt smaller, always smelt, felt less than. Everybody else was more mature in school. So I'm always at the back. That's how you always <laughs> felt. So I know what it's like to feel inadequate and to have God to tell you to do something and you don't feel capable of doing right. or you're the right person or feel out of place. Pat and I have always been, for some reason, somehow in churches that is predominantly white. Maybe because we got kicked out of the other one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's where that's where you are, and you have these feelings that you wrestle with all the time, that you never feel. Now I know the scriptures. There's a scripture that says not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. So the pendulum swings in both directions, but you have to find that balance there. Yeah, you know, you got to find that balance. We're not so much and we're so better than anyone else. We have to know that. But at the same time, we're not the scum of the earth. You know, so you have, to, you have to know that. You have to know who you are in Christ Jesus. You got to know that if God tells you to do something, that he's got your back. He's going to prove himself to you enough so that you can have that confidence. When you find yourself at your lowest point, you'll find here is God stepping up, saying, here I am, boy. You can do what I tell you to do. What I need you to do is just start stepping. Yeah, you got to do it. You would amaze people at your abilities when you just start acting upon the things that God's telling you. You will amaze yourself for your abilities. And you realize that, boy, this is not me. Yeah, it is not you. It is God that's inside of you. You see, we are three parts. We are mind, soul, and spirit. The spirit of God wants to move powerfully in you. He wants to use your body, but you have to allow him to use your body. Oftentimes, we will we'll hold our bodies from him so that his spirit can't work. Oh. And it's very, very possible yep. that you can just say, I'm not going to do it. If the Lord tells you to give a word to someone, you say, I'm not giving it to him. He won't force you to give it to him. Right. So they won't receive it. And you can't do what he wants you to do. But eventually, he's going to say, you know what? I'm going to have to find someone else who's willing to do what I need to do. So the anointing that should have been on you, you'll find is placed on someone else. And then you're going to find yourself looking back and saying, man, I wish I had acted when he told me to act. So if he's telling you to speak, you need to learn to speak. So, well, I don't have the ability. You can learn the ability. You can learn how to, you can learn scriptures. How many of you know that no one know, born knows the scriptures? When you're born, you don't know them. You have to learn them. That means you got to study, to show yourself approved, prove to yourself that you're a man or woman of God and that you can do what he wants you to do. Amen. It's up to you. There's no, short, there's no shortness on him. Amen. He wants that anointing on each one of you Amen. to do those things. Amen. But if you don't allow him to, uh -huh. he will not force you to. Amen. Now, some men in scriptures that he did force, like Jonah, But do you want to go through that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he can make you do what he wants you to do. Trust me, he can. But he won't. He asks you to. And he gives you the opportunity. As Melissa said, we get to do this. It's not that you have to do it. You get to do what he wants you to do. You're his child. Amen? Amen. Overcoming inadequacies. So whatever those things are that you're dealing with, I don't want to say get over them because that's so, work past them. Yeah. Work toward becoming more than just that because you can. And you can get jealous. You ever gotten jealous because the Lord used someone else instead of you? <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, you don't know what they've been going through. So you might be careful. <laughs> be careful how you get too jealous. Because you don't know what they're going through. You don't know the sleepless nights sometimes. They can't 
They lay in there trying to sleep, and the Lord is dealing with them about things. Uh -huh. Hurts that's breaking their hearts that they have to go through. Yeah. In ministry, to see people walk away that you've loved yeah. for no reason, Preach. and they're angry with you, and the only thing you're trying to do is do what God tells you to do. Uh -huh. Tell them. You think that don't hurt? It hurts. Yeah. For those that have children, you ever had children say, I don't love you no more. I like someone else. That is exactly what it feels like to be a pastor and have people walk out on you. Yeah. You know, it, it hurts. It's painful. Yeah. So before you get start looking at people, what they're doing, and say, boy, I want that. You just need to know. Yeah. There's some struggles that you go through with. And I have learned that if I keep talking, <laughs> I will run out. I'll say something that I probably shouldn't. <laughs> Amen. And I don't want to get in the flesh. <laughs> because my flesh gets me in trouble. Just like you always do. <laughs> yeah. Just like you always. Have you looking at people you shouldn't be looking at? <laughs> Have you thinking thoughts you shouldn't be thinking? Having you go in places you know you ain't got no business being. <laughs> yeah. Trying to fit in. Isn't it hard to fit in as a Christian sometimes? Oh, yeah. All your friends, they going and doing stuff that you can't do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to let, let Nathan do what we need to. I, I, I remember when I came to Christ, yeah, well, I had, been, I had been in church all my life. First of all, I grew up in church. Uh, I went to church before I was born. So I've, I've been in church all my life. And, um, but at, 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 there was one point when I was, I guess, becoming recommitted to Christ or it, whatever, the, whatever it was. And they used to have these things, sorority groups, and they would do these parties about once, twice a year. So I was invited to one of those, and, and I'd go to the party, and I was by myself, and so one of the ladies that I knew, she was from East Springs, and she said, Warren, Warren, um, they got some uh, alcohol, you know, some beer and wine and stuff if you want something to drink. I said, no, I'm good. I, I don't drink. I don't drink. Thank you. So we talked, and everybody talked, and then she said, uh, over in the bathroom, man, they, they doing some smokes over there if you want to. I said, no, I, I don't do that either. Then she said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and my response to her was I don't know what I'm doing here <laughs> so in a few minutes I got up I left never felt the need to ever go back to one again <laughs> sometimes you just have to find out who you are yeah. and know that it, hey this is about you am I upset with them for doing that no I still embrace them love them hug them do all those things I just don't participate in what they're doing and that's the, where we have to be with the world. You got family members that you're going to love them, and you see some of the stuff that they're doing, and you just can't be a part of it. Right. And it's not always your place to try to correct them. Yep. Amen. You, just, you just love them. Amen. And whenever the time comes, the Holy Spirit is the one that does the conversion. Right. It's not you. Amen. A lady told me once that her husband was unsaved. She said, I'm going to get him saved. I said, really? I said, how are you going to do that? She said, I preach to him every night. Oh. I said, he's going to leave. <laughs> she said, nope. She said, the only thing I'm giving him is the word. Within a year, within a year, they had separated and eventually divorced. You can't force anyone. You can't force people to Christ. You minister to them, and you let your life minister to them. It's not your preaching to them. It's your life minister to them. And when you do those things, um, people will come. Do you know I have never, ever witnessed to someone that Christ led me to that they did not receive him? Mm -hmm. Not once. No, I've, I've witnessed to a lot of people that he didn't lead me to right. just because I thought they needed Christ. Uh -huh. And they didn't come. Now, I'm not saying don't witness to people because we should. But your life should be your witness. And if that doesn't change people, other things probably not. Amen, Brother Nathan. 